A um, couple of things. Uh, I've started posting grades on the Moodle site. Um, I have exam one, problem set one graded, and some of you turned that in, turned those things in hard copy. I have your hard copies here. The rest of you turned it in digitally. I have those graded and I have them marked up. After I'm done with my two classes, I'll spend that, that free time at 1015 emailing those things out to you. So expect to get some, some emails with attachments attached to them um, this morning after I'm done with my two class sessions. Um, the exam grades for some of you were quite good and for others of you were really terrible. Uh, the nice thing about only having one exam in this class is that's the only exam that there is. And you guys are just generally doing better on problem sets and things like that. So um, the grade that is posted on a Moodle, that's out of 175 points. So you can calculate your percentage from that. Uh, I'm going to be working on getting your ANOVA problem set and ANOVA report graded, hopefully back to you by Wednesday, at which point everything that you've turned in so far this semester will be graded and we'll be all caught up on, on grading. Um, so don't let the, don't look at your exam grade and go, ah, <laughs> it's, it's not as bad as that looks. Look at the other things that are in there as well. Um, a couple of things that concern me about the exams were just, um, I want to make sure that you guys understand what the p-value is and how it's used and, and what 95% confidence intervals mean and how that all relates back to kind of this general idea of how the central limit theorem operates. That's one of the crucial things that you need to know about statistics. And if you're still sketchy about that, um, come and see me because if you don't have that, um, it's just, that's kind of one of the fundamentals. It's, it is the fundamental of doing the kinds of things that we're doing here. So uh, come and see me about, about clarifying those things. So questions about any of that? All right, uh, all the videos up to this point have been posted, so we're, we're up to date on, on the YouTube through the end of last week. Uh, this week is going to be a weird week because undergraduate colloquium is on Friday. Uh, so today, all of your Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes meet Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So you'll get a double dose of me in quick succession. Yay! Um, but that also means that your colleagues will be presenting research and creative work on Friday. And so I encourage you to take that time to uh, log on and um, view what your fellow students are doing and converse with them about what they're doing. Uh, because of COVID, uh, we didn't have a Duke Colloquium last year. And because of COVID this year, uh, the Duke Colloquium is all online because of safety. And so there is a program posted on uh, on the school's website. If you go to, if you just type in Duke Colloquium William Jewell College, it'll take you to a, a Colloquium Day website. On that website, there is a program, and in that program are Zoom links to all of the meetings. Um, there are oral presentations. And those are all organized in sessions, just like it would be at a regular colloquium day. There's a faculty moderator, and they go in 20-minute in blocks. There's three per hour, and then there's a break between sessions. Um, the faculty moderator is in charge of that meeting. And presumably, they've turned off all the bells and whistles so that when people exit and leave rooms and stuff like that, you're not getting that stupid chime all the time, which irritates me. Um, so you should be able to you know, see one person's presentation at 8.30 and another person's presentation at 8.50. Just like you would move between rooms on campus, you will be able to move between rooms virtually. You just realize that if you're moving room, you have to log in to a, a new Zoom, Zoom meeting. You guys should be very familiar with how that works now. The poster presentations, for those of you who have anybody that you want to go and see a poster of, um, each student is going to be running their own Zoom meeting. And so, each person has their own Zoom space to, devoted to their poster, and people can drop by and look at those as well. Um, 
This is the 20th anniversary of the Duke Colloquium, and so the speaker, normally there would be a luncheon uh, for the presenters of posters and oral presentations, um, and there would be a speaker at that. Uh, this year, the speaker is actually a student who was in the first group of students who um, who presented at the first Duke Colloquium 20 years ago. Uh, he is now an osteopathic surgeon here in Kansas City. Uh, he's also a team doctor for uh, the Kansas City Chiefs soccer, uh, the the local soccer team. What is it? Sporting KC, um, the Kansas City Ballet. He does a lot of sports um, sports consulting uh, for for organizations that you will recognize. Uh, so he's going to be the speaker. The cool thing about the speaker this year is that it's not just uh, available to the students who are presenting. Anybody can log on and hear what he has to say. I was just talking to him yesterday about what he was going to be, be talking about. So um, anyway, that's what Friday is for. So I will see you here on Thursday, even though that's not our normal, our normal day um, to meet. What else do I need? Yeah. On Thursday, so yeah, yeah, same same time. So uh, Thursday is just a Friday schedule. So your same Friday schedule, you'll go to all your classes on Thursday, like you would on Friday. Okay. So yep. have no, no, Thursday is a Friday this week. It's confusing, but just roll with it. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Uh, other questions. Last thing. Uh, I'm scheduled for my second vaccine on the 27th. Uh, hopefully you are also getting scheduled for your second vaccine on the 27th. The hope is that next fall we will have all been vaccinated and we will all be on campus um, not doing not doing this. Maybe still wearing masks, but, but certainly um, a little freer on in-person classes. Um, I was just, I just heard from a friend of mine who's a faculty member at University of California, Dominguez Hills, and the University of California system is still gonna be doing um, at least 50% remote learning in the fall because they have much bigger, um, much bigger population of students in a much more diverse community, um, students living at home, living with people who work in all kinds of different professions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is one of those situations where being in a kind of semi-rural, suburban, residential campus is actually really working to our benefit because there aren't that many of you and the administration can kind of have some level of control over you because you all live in dorms and things like this. And that's hopefully going to enable us to, to go back to on-campus in-person learning uh, quicker than like a, a large state school, school system like the University of California. So. Um, we are fortunate in that way uh, that some other schools are not. And I am looking forward to kind of getting back to semi-normal um, in the fall. So if you haven't gotten vaccinated, if you haven't gotten your first shot, please do that. And if you have gotten your first shot, make sure that you schedule your second shot. Um, all right. We're talking about regression. So we worked through this example last time. The calculations for doing a regression analysis are actually pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, what you basically need to know, like all things, you need to know means. So you get the mean of the x values, you get the mean of the y values. And so this is the mean of x, and this is the mean of y, and this variation around this line is the residual variation. It's the variation that is unexplained. And normally, if there wasn't a relationship between x and y, if you didn't know that x existed, this would just be the mean of y and its residual variation. But because we know that there is an x variable out there, that residual variation could be reduced because a part of the variation in y is explained by variation in x. And so we could, we could plot a best fit line through this cloud of points, and that best fit line would significantly reduce the residual variation. 
And so remember that when I talk about residual variation, residual just refers to variation that is not explained by whatever model you're looking at. And so um, I use this term constantly in this class, and I, I'm pretty sure I've, I've defined it a number of times. But just to make sure that I've done it formally, it's a variation that is not explained by whatever model you're using. In an ANOVA, the model that you're using is a model that has uh, data organized into treatments, and you're looking at variation that is explained or not by those treatments. In a regression, you're invoking the model of a line, and so you want to know how much of the variation isn't explained by that line. And so what you do is you arrive at a best fit line, and you look at, um, you look at the residual variation around that line, and the best fit line is, by definition, the line with the slope that results in the lowest amount of, of residual variation. That is the very definition of the best fit line. And so you can, you can solve these things analytically. And you would solve this analytically by just calculating the slope and the y-intercept. But another way that you could, that you could solve this, and back in early days of computing, when you had large data sets, uh, one of the ways that you could do this is, if you have a bunch of points, start with a line with a slope of zero, and then you could say, okay, well, what happens if I make the slope slightly positive? a slope of 0.1. Then recalculate the residuals. If the residual value goes up, total, total sum of squared residuals goes up, you move that line in the wrong direction. And so this would increase residuals because the residual value here was that, and now the residual value is that, so it's gotten bigger going positive. So you could then say, well, going positive was the wrong direction. Go a little bit negative. What you'll see then is total sums of squares of residual would go down, make the slope more slopey, negative. Residuals go down even further, make it more negative, goes down even further. But if you make it too negative, your residuals then start creeping back up again because you've, you've overshot the goal, and so you would creep back. So back in the old days of computing, and by old days, I mean like the 1970s, is actually how computers did it. They just randomly threw in, threw in slopes, calculated the line, calculated the residuals, compared that to whatever the last try was, and they slowly honed in on what the answer was through this iterative process. One of the things that computers are very good at is doing the same simple calculations over and over and over and over again, and so you can take advantage of the iterating properties of computers to solve it this way. When we're solving things by hand, we do it this way. So if you weren't here, hopefully you looked at the video and saw us work through this whole process. Um, these x's and y's that are in these formulae here are not the individual values of x and y that we normally think about. They're actually the headings for these columns. So um, x is the deviation from the mean of x. So x is actually 0 minus the mean, 12 minus the mean, 29.5 minus the mean. So it's the beginning of calculating sums of squares. The first thing that you do when you sum squares is you get the difference between the x value and its mean. And then the sums of squares, you square that, and then you add that all up across everything. So this is just the first part of that, the, this part in the parentheses. That's what x is. And then ultimately, you're going to square that. So you get the square 
and then you can sum that, sum that whole thing up. But because you have both x and y values, you have to do this for both the x and the y. So you need to know what the sums of squares is for the x, and you need to know the sums of squares for the y eventually. So, but then you also want to know how this deviation from the mean of x compares to this deviation from the mean of y. If the deviation from the mean of x is a positive deviation, and the deviation from the mean of y is a negative, that indicates that you have a negative slope on this best fit line rather than a positive slope. So this is, these two things become important in terms of determining what the slope is in terms of sine, is it positive or is it negative? Um, then this allows you to essentially calculate the slope. It's the sum of this xy column divided by the sum of the x squared column. And when you get that from this particular table, it gives you a slope of negative 0.05322, which is not a particularly steep negative slope. Um, then once you have that slope, you can use the average value of x and the average value of y to then calculate what the y-intercept will be. And then at that point, you have your equation for your line. You know what the best fit line is at this point. But that's only part of the task. The other part of the task is you need to test whether or not that slope differs from a slope of zero. And so that's what the statistical test is. So when we think about null hypotheses, In an ANOVA situation, what's the null hypothesis? What's the null for ANOVA? The mean of population one is what relative to population two or sample two? Yeah, they're equal. And those are equal to the mean of population three. And those are the same as the mean drawn from population four. And the alternative is that any of these could be different. And it only takes one. The null hypothesis in regression, though, what is the null hypothesis in regression? What are we, what were we just manipulating up here a few minutes ago? Yeah. In this case, the slope is equal to what? equal to zero. There is no relationship between x and y. You can vary x and that has no effect, no bearing, no systematic bearing on what y is. And the alternative is that the slope is not equal to zero. It's either positive or negative. And so the hypothesis that we're testing is this hypothesis of an equality to zero, not the equality to some other slope. It's does the, does the slope differ from zero or not? But that's analogous to, does the mean of sample one differ from the mean of sample two? Does this slope differ from a mean of, uh, a slope of zero? So in order to test those, it's, a, it's basically an analysis of variance sort of question. And what we are doing in the latter part of this table is we're generating the types of sums of squares that we need in order to test the slope to see if it's different from a slope of zero. So we basically plug these x values into the equation that we generated to give us the predicted values. That's what y hat is. 
This is done in Excel where you can't put a carrot over something, but why hat? Anytime you put a hat over something, this generally refers to a predicted value. What do we predict y to be given what x is based on the equation that we've generated? And so all you're really doing is you're plugging x into the equation. The equation in this case is um, mass loss equals 2 point Oh, sorry, 8.704, sorry. 8.704 minus 0 0.0533 times relative humidity. So you plug x into that value, you get what y is. That's what y hat is. But what that's really showing you is it's showing you For zero relative humidity, what is the value of Y on that line? For 25% relative humidity, what is the value of Y on that line? But then what you want to know is, for each of those values, what is the leftover residual unexplained variation? Well, the way you calculate that is you need to know what the predicted value is, what the value is on the line, and then you need to know how the actual observed value of y differs from that predicted value. And that is simply going to sum to 0 because those are residuals. And so we square those as well. And this gives you the sum squares residual. Uh, da, 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 da. And then y hat minus y bar, y bar is the overall average of the y values, y hat is the predicted values. You want to know how far these predicted values differ from a y bar because that gives you how much of the total variation is explained by the regression model that you have. So it's very analogous to what we're doing in, in analysis of variance, we want to know how much variation is explained by the model. In this case, the model is a line. And we want to know how much variation is unexplained by that model. And so it's kind of, well, it's, it's very analogous because you have sources of variation. One source of variation is explained by the regression model itself. Another source of variation is just all this residual variation that is unexplained by the regression. And those two things add up to the total variation. And as I mentioned last time in class, this total variation is actually found right here. It's the variation of each of these values of y from the mean of y squared and added up, 24.131. This is sum squares total, and that should equal sum squares residual plus sum squares regression. And so it's just an analysis of variance, except that now in the case of the sources of variation, what your model is defining a line as opposed to a bunch of sample means. But it's the same, it's the same type of calculation. So you will recall back when we first started down the path of parametric statistics, after we talked about sampling theory and things like this, I told you this is the most important equation in statistics, and it's because the numerator is the sums of squares. The denominator is the degrees of freedom. And this is the basis of analysis of variance. This is the basis of regression. This is the basis of so many things. 
because these are how we quantify variation of one thing compared to another. How does the individual x value vary from the mean? How does one mean vary from the grand mean of an entire data set? One way of thinking about regression is to think of this line as the running average of mass loss as relative humidity changes. At low relative humidity, the mass loss is high. At high relative humidity, the mass loss is low. This is the average mass loss as relative humidity changes. That's what the line is. So in this way, these residuals are just within sample variation along that running average. And that way it's no different than a static average in an ANOVA. Okay. So this is where we get not only the equation, but it is also where we get the test to see if the equation has a slope that is significantly different from zero. It generates mean squared or mean squared uh, regression and mean squared residual. Mean squared regression divided by mean squared residual is F, and you test this F statistic the same way you would test an F statistic from an analysis of variance. Same, same. Everything the same. Okay? Quick recap of what we spent all of last class period doing. That, is that clear? Okay. Anytime you're doing parametric statistics, there are assumptions that must be met for you to be able to trust the, the output. What are these assumptions? We've talked about these periodically throughout the semester. Okay, so one of those is normality. Is that the most important one? No, of course it isn't. It's typically listed third in textbooks. During ANOVA, I would always write this thing, this particular assumption, as a normality of the distribution of sample means. Uh, in this case, because there is no, no multiple sample means, it's just going to refer to the, the distribution of residuals. So these residuals. These residuals here, those should be normally distributed around the line. So essentially, if we take this, go to the mean, which is a little over 50, and we move each of these values up parallel to the line, and move these down parallel to the line, the distribution that they make around the line should be normally distributed. Okay, so that's what this, this is how this normality assumption looks in a regression model. What are the other assumptions? Okay, so a homogeneity of variances. The variances are similar. Once again, this is slightly different for regression because the assumption is that 
across the x values, the variation around the line is similar. And there, so basically, it's not really wide variation at one spot and narrow variation at another spot and wide variation at another spot. This generally takes three forms when you violate this, when you violate this assumption. A common form is that you have more variation at the extreme ends of the data set than you do in the middle of the data set. This would be a non-constant variance across X. Another form of violation of this is that you have the same slope, really narrow variation at one end, and it gets wider the further along in X that you get. Another form of lack of variation, constancy around this is that it starts wide and gets narrow. All of these would be violations of the, the variance test, the, the equivalent of a Levine's test. It's not a Levine's test in regression, but the idea is that variation around the line should be constant as x varies. Seldom do you see data that look like that. The most common that you see, the most common thing that you see is you tend to see this situation. And the reason for this is, is that as you get to extreme values of x, either extreme values high or extreme values low, you oftentimes have less data represented in those tails of your sampling. And as a result, because you have less data out there, your variances are just bigger. In the same way that if you have a small sample size in an ANOVA, your variances are bigger. And so this is not really all that surprising. What are the other, the other assumptions? These are assumptions that you can't test until after you've gathered your data. There are a couple of assumptions that you take care of before you go and gather your data. Okay, independence. In this case, In the case of regression, there's a certain degree of non-independence because for every x variable, there is a y variable associated with it. So in that way, your data are paired, but this particular pairing of xy data is independent of this particular pairing of xy data. Those two are independent of this one. So independence is part of it. What is another part of it? Okay, the data collected are random. So you're randomly sampling the data from some theoretical distribution. Um, now in this case, the random sampling from the distribution we're talking about is actually the sampling of y. Because recall from the introduction to regression, generally when you do regression, you the researcher are selecting what x is. X is not randomly sampled. X is set by the researcher, set by the person who has the question. And then based on those X's, you're drawing Y's from a random sample of Y's that are responding to X. And so this generally refers to the, the response variable is random. Okay. We talked about a different form of regression, which we're not going to go through and work on, where you actually have the x variable being a randomly drawn um, sample. But we're going to assume that this researcher chose these relative humidities, set those relative humidities, and then just look to see how y responded to that relative humidity, how mass loss responded to that relative humidity. This is very similar to the, the assumptions for an ANOVA or a t-test or whatever else. These are the parametric statistics assumptions just tailored to regression. Well, we have ways of, of testing these things. How can we test for normality? <laughs> 
how do we test for normality in an ANOVA? If this is a number line that, that x varies across, and these are different treatments, how do we test for normality in this situation? Yeah, we would use the Shapiro Wolf test. And what would we put into that Shapiro Wolf test? Yeah, we would measure the residual variation around x. But because x1, x2, and x3, and x4 all differ, we would use the within sample variation, within sample residuals, because if we compared these to the grand mean, for example, you would actually just be picking up differences due to, due to the different treatments. So we calculate within sample residuals for each of these points, and we would throw them all into one big pile that has all the residuals from all of the treatments, and then we would conduct a superior woke test on the residuals. So how would we do that? for a regression. What if this regression, what if this data set was not a best fit due to a line? What if the data looked like this and you plotted a line through this cluster of points? What would that line look like? A straight line. Well, what do you mean by gap? Yeah, you would get a line that would go something like this. So at low values of x, you might have positive and negative values, but at intermediate values of x, all of the residual values would be negative, and then you would have, once again, a, another cluster of points that are positive residuals here. And so what you would expect to see if you did a residual plot where x, where x is the x variable and you plotted the residuals, you would see that Residuals should always be centered at zero, because some of them are positive, some of them are negative. At the beginning, you would have residuals on both sides of the zero line. But then in the middle, you would have a bunch of negative ones. And at high levels of x, you would have a bunch of positive ones. If you compress all of this across this thing, what you will probably see is a residual plot that looks non-normal around that line because you have this big cluster of points that are all negative, smaller cluster of points up here that are all positive. So you do have positives, but that appears as a tail at the end of this distribution of largely negative residuals. That's non-normality. So how would we how would we test that? What's illustrated on the screen right now? The line of best fit, and what about the what what are we also plotting around that line? Yeah, we're also plotting the, the length, the distance of the residuals. So we could actually just ask R, for example, to give us the residuals around the regression line, and then throw those residuals into a shapiro wolf test, just like we did by asking our what is the variation around each of the means in an ANOVA.
and then testing those residuals to see if they're normally distributed or not. Same thing happens, same thing occurs. And it will pick up patterns of non-normality when we have poor fit of the model to the data. So test normality the same way you would test it with an ANOVA. You ask what residual variation is there left over and is that residual variation normally distributed? The fourth assumption, the variances assumption, is a little trickier and we're not going to go through the mechanics of it, but there is a test. It's called a non-constant variance test. which basically just tests to see if the value of the residuals around the line varies as you go across the, the x-axis in this thing. And it returns a statistical test that basically tells you, do you have constant variance or do you have variance that varies as you move across x? So we can, we can test both of these things just like we could test them in a ANOVA, in one case, we're using the same exact test that we used before, the Shapiro-Wilk test. And then in another case, we're using a different type of test that does the same analogous thing to the Levine's test. So same way that you would test Shapiro-Wilk's test and Levine's test. In an ANOVA, you will do a Shapiro-Wilk test and a non-constant variance test in a regression model. Questions? Okay, let's go back to our ANOVA table. Last time, for those of you who were here, I introduced you to a concept called R square. Who remembers what R square is? Sorry, Haley, this is bugging the crap out of me. I keep looking at it. <laughs> Messing with my OCD. Who can tell me what R square is? Okay. Good. So, sum squares regression in this case is 23.514, but total variation is only 24.131, which basically means that the regression model explains almost all of the variation in the raw data. So you have this overall variation in Y, You have this overall variation in Y, but when we fit a best fit line through that, the linear model that we fit to these data accounts for almost all of that residual variation. Residual variation when the slope is zero, almost all of that disappears when we plot the best fit line through there. So what this is saying, essentially, when we do this is the model basically relates the x value to the y value. And so when we look at the sums of squares regression, we're basically asking how much of variation in y is essentially being explained by x? Well, it's that much of the total. So whenever these two things are very close to one another, R square is high. I think in this case it's 0.97 something, right? We, we worked it out last time. Yep. 
which basically means that x explains 97% of the variation in y. There's very little unexplained variation left over once you fit this line to the data. R square goes down as your best fit line gets worse and worse. R square also goes down as your spread of data around the line is more variable, as your total residual variation goes up. So these data points are right along the line, right? Right along the line. If they were more spread out, your sum squares residual would be bigger. And what that would do is that would increase the size. You know, right now your sum squares residual is really small. What that variation around the line would do is it would increase the sum squares total while leaving the sum squares regression alone. And so as the data are more variable around the line, Sum squares total gets bigger and bigger and bigger, which means that this stays the same, which means your R squared goes down. Because X explains less and less variation in Y because Y is quite variable around the line. Okay? So we can think about R squared as kind of a diagnostic tool. An R squared of 1 is when all of the points lie right on top of the line. If you know x, you know what y is. Therefore, x explains 100% of the variation in y. You get a little bit of spread to your data. X is still, variation in x is still explaining variation in y, but there's more residual variation that is unexplained. So your r square value goes down. You get even more variation around the x value. Your R square goes down even further. R square is point, uh, 0.69. So X, variation in X is still explaining variation in Y, but it's just explaining less of the variation in Y. And you can get this down to the point where X stops explaining much variation in Y at all. And so it's important to pay attention to R square because it's an important metric of how well your x variable is explaining variation in your y variable, whatever your x and y variables are. Now, why do I want to belabor this point? Well, I want to belabor this point because you sometimes get stuff like this. So an actual paper by a guy named Anders Moeller, who is a biologist, published this paper back in the 1990s. I read it when I was in grad school. Um, you guys know what barn swallows are? Yep. Uh, look them up on your computers real quick. Male barn swallows in particular. Hirundo rustica. What's that? Oh, really? Yeah. They do like to, to nest in things like barns and stuff. What do you notice about a barn swallow when you look at it? The males in particular have what? Look at one in flight in particular. Samuel, what does that bird look like as it's flying? Look, okay, so it's got V-shaped wings. What do, what's going on with its tail? Yep, and it is also long. Well, as it turns out, in a number of bird species, long tails are viewed by the opposite sex as being very sexy. <laughs> 
And there's this idea in biology called sexual selection where females choose males based on their phenotype. And in some birds like peacocks and barn swallows and widow birds, uh, look up widow birds on your computer as well. It's a bird that occurs in the savannas of Africa. Widow bird in flight in particular. What do they have? They have super long tails. They are super sexy. Uh, scissor tail flycatchers, another species here in the United States that has really long tails. And the idea is that females find long tails sexy. So they preferentially mate with males that have long tails. And if there's a genetic basis to long tailedness in males, then that gets passed on to, from generation to generation because only long-tailed males are allowed to breed because females only find long-tailed males worth breeding with. But because the same genes that determine tail length in males also probably determine tail length in females, as the females select on tail length in males, tail length in females gets kind of drug along. So what you should expect to find over time is you should expect to find a correlation between male tail length, male tail length, and female tail length. And so that's what these two figures are about. Now, whenever you see a figure like this, you should pay attention to the caption because in the caption, there is useful information here. It tells you the F statistic. So for this first regression up here, relating male tail length to female tail length, uh, the F statistic is 33.05. The P value is less than 0 0.0001, an extremely um, significant p-value, but the r-square value is 0 0.09. But the degrees of freedom on this f statistic are one degree of freedom for estimating the line and 336 degrees of freedom for the residual term. So when you look at those lines, does that look like a significantly strong slope of the line? It's going up, but it's not going up precipitously. And there's a lot of variation around the line, which you would think would tend to erode your ability to test to see if that line is different from a slope of zero. Shallow slope, the slope here, The equation of the line is also in the, in the figure. It's female tail length is 68.96 is the y-intercept plus 0.17 times male tail length. That slope value is really not that far from zero. Yet the regression equation is significantly different from zero. But the reason for that is not that the slope value is so high. The reason for that is that whatever the mean square, sorry, whatever the sum square regression is, whatever that is, it's divided by one. And whatever the sum square's residual is, This is divided by 336. When you do that, this makes the mean square regression the same as the sum square regression, but it makes the mean squared residual really tiny because you have a huge numbers of degrees of freedom because you looked at 337 pairs of birds.
You have what's known in the business as a shitload of data. You have a lot of statistical power so that you can find really small differences between a slope of zero and whatever slope it is that you're observing. But even though that slope is highly significant, does it provide much explanatory power? What does knowing about male tail lengths tell you about female tail lengths? Does it tell you something? Does it tell you a lot? Does it tell you a little? How do you know? What, what do you look at to, to ascertain that? On the board. I began going down this path because I was teaching you about something a little while ago. What tells you about the explanatory power of x? Does p-value tell you that? Does f tell you that? R squared tells you that. So in this case, how much variation in y does variation in x explain? Nine percent. So here we have a highly significant regression in which x tells you almost nothing about y. When I read this paper, I looked at these regressions. I looked at the, the statistics in the caption. I'm like, why on earth should I care about those regressions? The only thing that this regression shows me is that Anders Muller has a tremendous amount of statistical power because he measured a shitload of birds. The variation in female tail length is influenced by male tail length, but that relationship is not particularly strong in spite of the fact that it's a significant regression because the R-square value is really, really low. The explanatory power of X to explain variation in Y is almost non-existent. Explains 9% of the variation, which means that there's a lot of variation in y that's just not explained. So in this case, the sum square regression is small relative to sum squares residual it's just that what saves this particular data set is that you have a very large sample size. And that very large sample size reduces the mean square so that you can adequately test what is essentially a very weak regression, a, a regression of really shallow slope. Not steep slope regression, but shallow slope regression. So you have, to, you have to assess all of these things in evaluating a regression model. Not only can you discern whether the regression is different from a slope of zero, but then also how useful is that regression in explaining variation? Give me a big enough data set and I can distinguish a slope that is really tiny from a slope of zero. If you give me a large enough degrees of freedom in the residual term. Now, is it gonna tell us anything about the relationship between those two variables? No. This is one of those situations where you have to think about sample size in a different way than you think about it in ANOVA. In ANOVA, the more data you have, generally the better off you are. 
because when you have an experiment that has a bunch of treatments, you have to spread subjects across those treatments, and it takes time and money to do that. And so generally in ANOVA, people are fighting to get more and more sample. But the same thing happens in ANOVA sometimes. You can have an analysis of variance where the differences that you're finding are really, really tiny, such that even though they may be statistically significant, they may not be different in any meaningful way in the real world. So this gets to this idea of statistical significance versus practical significance. And this is where statistical power, discussions of statistical power come in. If you have a large enough sample size in an ANOVA, you can detect differences among means that are really tiny. But there may come a point where your sample size is so big that the little tiny differences that you can detect as statistically significant don't really have any practical meaning. Because you've killed that analysis with sample size. You've crushed it. Same thing happens, only it happens quicker with increases in sample size and regression. If you have a large enough sample size in regression, you can detect a slope that is different from a slope of zero, but that difference may be so small that it doesn't really have any practical consequences. And so you have to evaluate all these things simultaneously. What is the p-value for the F statistic that you generated? How does that compare to the sample size that you have in the analysis, and how does that compare to the R square value? And then you can evaluate how much stock you're going to put in that regression on the basis of all of that information. And you can't just look at the p value and say, ooh, high p or low p value, that's a significant relationship. Is that clear? Okay, we didn't get around to live coding today, but what we're going to do next time is we're going to start with the weight loss data set. We're going to code this using the linear models function in R. And so what your homework is for Wednesday is look up linear models on the internet and R and figure out what the syntax would be for analyzing the weight loss data and take a stab at running just a simple regression to get output. And the output that you get should appear in an ANOVA table and that ANOVA table should match the data, the data analysis that we did in the PowerPoints. Come to class ready to share that. As it turns out, if you have an ANOVA, I have taught you to analyze ANOVAs using the AOV function in R. Turns out, if you go back to any of the ANOVAs you've run, and so this is also part of your homework for Friday, or for, for Wednesday, rather, Go back to any of your ANOVAs. It can be the PEAS data set. It can be a homework assignment or, or any ANOVA that you have a data file for. Take that same ANOVA model, plug it into LM, and then when you're done with this, type in summary.aov for whatever your model is. So if you, if you define a model as a linear model, Take the same syntax for the ANOVA, put an LM in front of it instead of an ANOVA, and when you do this, it should give you the same ANOVA model that you get from doing it with AOV. Linear models and ANOVAs are all linear models. It's just that AOV, AOV will do an ANOVA but not a regression. LM is much more general such that LM will do regressions as well as ANOVAs. So. We're going to start breaking down the barriers in thinking ANOVA is different from regression. ANOVA and regression are exactly the same, such that you can analyze both ANOVA and regression using the same scripting code for, for both.
of those things. So, so play around with that and do some exploration on your own. We're going to start live scripting the, the uh, weight loss data set, which is already up on Moodle. After we've live scripted that, I put another data set on Moodle that has to do with mass shootings because, yay, pandemic is loosening up. So now we're back to mass shootings. Uh, so there's a mass shooting data set on there that can also be analyzed with regression. So we'll, after we finish going through and live coding the, um, the mass loss data set, we'll then go through and live code the, uh, the amazingly depressing mass shooting data from the United States. And so come prepared on, on Wednesday to just basically spend the whole day in, in live coding. All right? And I'll see you guys then. Doing all right? Oh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> you know, you know, chi-square is the most, most maligned and abused test on the planet. Yeah. Oh, yeah, people...